Welcome to class number three of Startup School with Startup Canada and Concierge Service. Startup School is a program of Startup Canada Live, a monthly webinar series dedicated to the professional development of Canada's entrepreneurs and community leaders. My name is Catherine Forrest and I am the Communications and Marketing Manager here at Startup Canada. I'm your host for today and I will be introducing our featured guest in just a few moments. Today's class on Gathering Market Intelligence is presented by Concierge Service, a Government of Canada program delivered by the National Research Council of Canada Industrial Research Assistance Program. Through a team of specialized innovation advisors, Concierge provides free, customized guidance to help you access the most relevant programs you need to grow your business. Now today we're pleased to feature Peter Howell. He's an innovation advisor based in St. John's, Newfoundland. Peter has over 20 years of SME-related experience, including 15 years working with commercialization of new technology. In addition to his work as an innovation advisor with Concierge, Peter has worked as a business analyst at the Technology Incubation Incubator Genesis Center, where he not only mentored tech startups, but also helped them to secure funding for commercialization. So the format for today's session will include a presentation by Mr. Howell, followed by Q&A. So all of our listeners can ask questions using the hashtag Startup School on Twitter, and we'll get to them uh, during the Q&A portion. So welcome, Peter. We're thrilled to have, it, have you today, and I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much, and it's very good to be here today. Uh, what Catherine didn't mention in the, in the introduction was for um, the last uh, 10 years, uh, in my role with NRC IRAP, um, I was what was called a technical business analyst, and my job was to gather market intelligence for uh, IRAP, uh, Industrial Technology Advisors, and uh, IRAP clients, and this information then helped to uh, strengthen the quality of the projects that we were doing with IRAP. So I have a lot of experience in this field, and when I was approached to put, a, put together another session for the uh, the training program, I thought, well, what a great idea to actually uh, give you a little bit of a uh, short course in gathering market intelligence and uh, to kind of run through uh, what the process looks like and some of the mechanics of it. So, uh, and that's what I'm going to do today. I've got a presentation I'm going to run through. I apologize uh, up front if it's a little dry in places. Uh, it is a very much a mechanical process that I'm going to talk about. And, uh, but what I'm hoping to do is to give you some tools so that you can actually do a, a better job of, of this in your, uh, in your company or in your business or in the role that you're in. Uh, and you know, I'll give you some pointers as well to different sources for information and, uh, and also some, uh, some items expertise as to where you can go to find more information about this process. So, uh, so as I said, it's going to be a bit of a... Uh, I hear someone typing. If, if someone doesn't have their thing on mute, maybe you can uh, put it on mute. Okay, so from an, from an executive summary point of view, I'm going to talk about, like I said, the mechanics. So what is market intelligence? I'm going to go over a process that uh, that's used in the industry called uh, Kits and Kicks, which is key intelligence topics and key, and key intelligence questions and generation of a mandate. I'm going to talk about gathering information. I'm going to talk about information analytics and how you can actually analyze information to give you... Uh, uh, meaningful, actionable intelligence, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the delivery of what you find and the importance of getting buy-in from, from management. So why do you gather market intelligence? Why do you go out there and do this exercise? Uh, there's a number of reasons, uh, you know, from better understanding your competitive environment, knowing uh, where you are uh, in relation to the competition. Uh, you know, it, it, there's also the elements of of who has the technologies that you're trying to develop? Who's where you're? Who, who's already? Ha who already has uh, competitive parity to where you, what you have now? Uh, who's a lot further along than you are? Who are they engaged with? Uh, you know, who are they partnering with? Who's investing in your competitor companies? Uh, what patents have they filed? What IP do they have? Um, you know, uh, it's also very important to use it to validate your assumptions. A, a lot of times. When you sit down, uh, and I know uh, the lean startup model is very popular, uh, you know, and, and the business model canvas uh, is a very popular tool. But in a lot of cases in these exercises, you know, it's about trying to identify what your unique value proposition is. 
but you need to have information from the marketplace that you can use to validate or correct the assumptions that you're making and so it's very important that you base uh, base those tools on sound market information and, and this process will help you do that and, and you know and by default it really helps determine what what go to market strategy you're going to use and uh, you know what strategic direction your company is going to go in and uh, you know if you don't do sound market intelligence uh, then you're really going blind so the, there's a field of, of, uh, of uh, study called competitive intelligence. Some of you may or may not have heard of it before. It, it's really a uh, you know kind of an interchangeable sort of term with market intelligence. Business intelligence is part of it as well. And really, what it is, it's a systematic ethical program for gathering, analyzing, and managing external information that can affect your company's plans, decisions, and operations. This is kind of a formal definition that was. Uh, uh, that, that is followed by the uh, the governing agency over this field uh, called SCIP or the Strategic and, and Competitive Intelligence Professionals. And what I've done is I've actually given you the URL to that organization. Uh, and this this organization is a phenomenal resource in this regard. Uh, they do uh, training sessions on a, on a regular basis uh, all over the world. Uh, they have a, a fantastic uh, conference that they run pretty much every spring. It's their big AGM. And I've gone to this on a number of occasions. Uh, and it's kind of a who's who of uh, corporate America that you see at these events. You know, it's all Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies. And you will see often, you know, some Canadian companies that you may or may not expect to see there. And they have some tr fantastic training opportunities at these sessions where they can really help you learn the craft. And, and this really is a craft. And, and Skip is a, is a great resource. Uh, they also have a membership process as well, which you might even look at for your business, uh, which provides you with a lot of training and unique tr uh, training opportunities and webinars and, uh, and so on. So uh, I, I just want to make a plug for that because I think it's very important to, to have a look at that. So the goal with uh, competitive intelligence really is to understand your competitive environment. And, you know, we tend to uh, be very, in, uh, in uh, the concierge role, we're talking about companies that typically are doing innovation. So really we, we look at things from a technology market and competitor perspective. And what we're trying to find is how those three things uh, over, overlap and, and interoperate. So, you know, what current R&D activities are going on? You know, what are some of the market drivers that are uh, influencing where the market's going? Where is it heading? Who are the key players? What are some of the key player relationships? These are the sorts of things uh, that we're trying to do when we're trying to understand the competitive op environment that we're operating in, right? And so it's very important to really look at uh, these three elements uh, onto themselves and then really see how they interoperate. So some of the cornerstones of competitive intelligence uh, is that the information and results you get must be current, timely, accurate, and you must use defensible analysis. And what I mean by defensible analysis is that, uh, you know, you're not basically just pulling something out of your hat. You've actually used a sound information that you've gathered and you've used sound techniques that have been developed uh, that you can actually uh, follow back the process on if anyone questions it or, or uh, is wondering what you, how, you, how you came about these results. Uh, and from an act uh, accurate or from a timely point of view, uh, you know, a lot of times these the information you're gathering, the intelligence you're gathering, is uh, used for decision making in the firm, and so it must be timely. It's no good to you know provide information on things that happened three or four months ago uh, if they've already happened and your findings are are too late to the game. Uh, you also must uh, collect information using legal and ethical methods. Uh, th there's full courses you can do on ethics in competitive intelligence. Uh, suffice to say, competitive intelligence is not competitive espionage. And uh, really, the things you do uh, must clearly be legal and ethical. And uh, in your organization, you're, you must really sit down and decide what you're prepared or not prepared to do. And uh, there's lots of guidelines out there in the industry that lay this out, and I would suggest that you have a look at that if you're going down this road. Uh, another thing I'll say about the findings you come up with is that 
information is only information. Intelligence is, is, has to be actionable. And, and, and so you're really trying to answer the question, so what? You know, why is this information important? How am I going to change uh, things in my firm or in my company, in my startup, because of the information or the intelligence that was provided? And, and to me, that last statement on that slide is, is one of the most powerful statements uh, in, all this, in this whole sort of field of, of uh, uh, endeavor is, is that how are things done differently because of the intelligence provided? I know I'm reiterating it, but I think it's so important to realize that. And when you think about it, uh, you know, good, good, uh, good intelligence will change behavior. And, uh, and it, it'll, it, it's uh, one of those things that uh, will drive the direction which the firm goes in. So here's a diagram of something that uh, you'll, you'll probably see many different uh, iterations of when you start looking for you know, competitive intelligence process. And it's what's called the intelligence cycle. And it's really a process. And a lot of the process for competitive intelligence uh, it was derived uh, by intelligence gathering agencies like the CIA. Uh, a number of training sessions I've done uh, in this field were delivered by ex-CIA employees and a lot of the information or, or the processes and the analysis techniques were developed uh, around that and so a lot of the, the players that you see you know have a history and track record in that field. Uh, so it's a, it's a fairly simple model. Uh, you start off with a needs assessment so you find out what the intelligence needs are. Uh, you do a, a develop the key intelligence topics and you do the kits and kicks process that I alluded to earlier and which I'm going to explain in some detail in a couple slides. Uh, then you do a search and validation where you actually go out and find the information and you validate the information and make sure it's accurate. And in a lot of cases what happens is if you do a good job at finding the right information, uh, you'll start to see trends, you'll start to see patterns, uh, you'll find the same information from a number of different sources and then you start to realize that you're on the right track and that you've uh, probably got enough to move forward. Uh, then you'll do some analysis and synthesis and by that I mean uh, there's a number of analysis techniques you can use to kind of massage the information to, uh, to try to find some of the answers to the questions you're asking. And, and then there's uh, the, the assembly and reporting process and, uh, and that's really where you actually decide how you're going to put the information together. And, and that really falls back to you know, the needs assessment and what the client needs. And then you're going to develop uh, the, uh, the peripherals you need to do presentation and delivery. And that can take a lot, of number, uh, a lot of different forms as well. And again, it comes back to what the customer needs. If you're the, you know, the CEO of the company and you're also the chief technical officer and the chief operation officer, uh, then you're probably doing it for yourself, in which case, uh, you know, you, you provide what you need. But in a lot of cases, you know, if you're providing this information to management, then management uh, will will help you determine what it is they want to see in a deliverable. So, gathering market intelligence is really about answering businesses' critical questions. So these are things like what market vertical should the firm compete in? Uh, and how big are the various market verticals? Uh, what is the nature of the competitive environment? So who, who are you competing against? And how many times uh, do uh, I hear or I've, have I heard over the years uh, from startups is that there's no competitors to what they have. And you know, in, in the simplest sense with some new technologies, especially if it's a, a new approach to a marketplace, there may not be any direct competitors to, to the actual product or uh, or service that they've created, but uh, there's always a substitute. Uh, you know, irregardless uh, of uh, what you have, someone is doing uh, what uh, you're trying to solve with something. And in a lot of cases, it's a substitute product, right? It's it's something that can solve the problem incompletely uh, and. Uh, and get the job done. It's it's like uh, you know I'm going to use an example a little later on about uh, practice management software for medical practices. But you know if you're a doctor's office and you're using uh, you know files and paper, then that's not a direct competitor to uh, to a uh, you know software service. 
but what you're competing with is that paper-based system, and you really need to develop your strategy around how I, how am I going to compete with that? Uh, and so that's very important to have that in the thought process here. Um, another big thing is is what the IP climate is. Uh, you know, can you patent the technology? Uh, you know, what patents are in play? How much litigation has occurred? Uh, and a, a very important thing uh, is to be able to identify whether you have freedom to operate and and I don't know how many of you have heard that terminology before, but really what it means is that uh, the space around the technology development you're doing uh, is not already tied down by someone's existing patents. And so knowing that before you get too far into the process is very important, A, from the point of view of being able to do your business, and B, from being able to protect your IP. Uh, Another thing to consider too is you know what the technology adoption rates are in the industry, the maturity of technology, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, another thing that's very important to consider too is, is is a concept called technology leverage. And the idea with technology leverage, for those of you who, are, who aren't familiar, it's about how much technology is the market ready to use. And in a lot of cases with startups, in particular, uh, they get into a, a process of technology or feature creep and they tend to way over build uh, products based on what they think uh, the market needs and in a lot of cases you really need to nail that down because you know a it may be uh, important to give them everything but if they're only going to use a small part of it then why would you a, why do you a do it and and b why wouldn't you hold that back for future iterations of the of the product uh, you know it, it's like um, one of the one of the things I dealt with a number of years ago was uh, TVs, you know, uh, LED, LCD, OLED technology. And in a lot of cases, the technology you're starting to see on the shelf today, you know, in the 4K TVs, that may have been developed 10 years ago, but was never released to the market because the signal processing wasn't up to the challenge of uh, of that high level of resolution. And so what happens was, you know, that stuff stays in the can until the the uh, the technology uh, reaches a point where uh, it's able to utilize the utility that that can provide, and so you know, and, and this applies to pretty much any technology. You need to really understand that and understand uh, what is uh, the capability of the marketplace, uh, and, and and when when you go to market with your technology, uh, then that's really where you, you try to align it, and and that really comes from gathering really good market intelligence. And then the other big thing that you're trying to nail down is, you know, does the business model you're going forward make any sense? So uh, this kits and kicks process, or key intelligence topics and key intelligence questions, is is a very powerful tool. Uh, it again was developed. Uh, there was a gentleman who's uh, Jan Herring was his name, and he he was a a, a long time CIA analyst, and he he's kind of credited as being a bit of the father of this process and. He does training sessions, and he's uh, uh, on this topic. And, and it's actually a two-day session that I did a few years ago on this. Uh, I'm going to do it in five minutes. But I would encourage you to go out and do some research on this and to find out a little bit more about it because it's a very powerful process. And, and the key idea here is to go from very general to very specific uh, with uh, your intelligence gathering process. And so... The idea with the key intelligence topic is that you're trying to, there's a key problem uh, that you're trying to find the answer for. You know, so, uh, you know, uh, who are your key competitors and how are they going to influence uh, the adoption of technology in the marketplace? You know, it's a very broad, uh, sort of nebulous uh, question that doesn't have a, uh, an obvious, you know, uh, answer. And, and so to find an answer to that question, you then develop a series of questions called the key intelligence questions, which fall underneath it. And, it, you know, you typically would have for any one uh, kit, you'd have three to five kits or kicks. And the idea is that you answer very, you find, you find questions that are very specific and that have very achievable answers. And, and using the three or five together can give you a very good uh reasonable representation of an answer to the big question. And so that's really how that process works. And so what you do is in a, when you're developing a, uh, 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 or trying to 
develop a deliverable for a client, and I, I say client, it could be yourself uh, or management or you know, it could be a consultant, whatever. The idea is that in that mandate, you, you identify that these are the, the, the kits that we're going to uh, work on and these are the, uh, the, the intelligence questions we're going to try to answer to solve that. And so it actually prevents you from going off and doing an ocean boiling exercise because you know specifically what you're trying to find. Uh, you know, and you may not find it all, but at least you have a good understanding of what that is. So, uh, kits can typically be broken into three broad categories. Uh, there's management uh, issues and decisions, and these are things to support, like things like strategic planning. Uh, there's early warning topics, and these are things like uh, identifying new emerging competitors. Um, they may may talk. Or you may look at you know significant changes in industry, in government, in technology. Uh, a lot of times, uh, from an early warning point of view, uh, you may want to look at the uh, regulatory environment. And so, you may set up something called an alert, where you look at a regulatory environment for a particular uh, company area, or technology area, or service area. And on a regular basis, you come back with a product that says, "We've looked at it. Nothing's changed. We've looked at it." Here's the changes. Uh, how does that affect your business? Uh, and then there's things called key players, and and that's more typical for a lot of uh, a lot of uh, startups because you're trying to understand what your competitors are doing, what their capabilities are, what their intentions are, what their actions are going to be. You know, you want to know what their next move is, and so you know these are things like uh, you know have they found investment? What's the state of their IP? What's their pricing model? Uh, and and, and those are the sorts of things that would fall into that category. So uh, I give I give you an example here of a of a you know kind of a kit kit sort of thing. And again, this is uh, not meant to be super specific, but it's it's I think it illustrates uh, what we're talking about. So in this particular case, it's something I, I had from a uh, report I did several years ago, and the company's long gone out of business, so I thought it was safe to share. Uh, so the company was basically doing some uh, cloud-based practice management software, had a, an existing vertical that they were selling in, and they were looking for the next best opportunity. So the kit for that particular case was what medical discipline represents the best next opportunity for a cloud-based practice management software. And so some of the kicks from that could have been, uh, you know, who are the current suppliers of practice management software? You know, what forms of medical practices are they selling into? And by forms, I mean, you know, is it an optometrist? Is it a dentist? Is it a uh, 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 massage therapist, uh, you know, what is the delivery method for the product? So how do they sell the product? Is it a software base? Is it a, a box software? Is it a software as a service? Is it a hybrid? Uh, you know, what are the current pricing models being used? So, you know, is it a, uh, you know, one-time boxed uh, software? Uh, is it a one-time fee with a service agreement on an annual basis? Is it a monthly fee? Is it an annual fee? You know, uh, these are all important things. Uh, and then sort of a, a much uh, broader kick could be, you know, how quickly are clinics in the various disciplines adopting software systems to manage workflow? And these are the sorts of things that you can use a little bit of analysis to come up with some uh, with some reasonable answers that are, are pretty good guesses at uh, uh, the, uh, the rates involved here. So uh, now I'm going to move into... Uh, the next part of the process. It's really about gathering information. Uh, and I want to distinguish the difference between two primary, not the right word, uh, two different types of information gathering. One is primary and the other is secondary. And, and primary information sources are, are typically what they call human intelligence. It's actually, you know, working with customers, working with uh, uh, clients, talking to people at trade shows, um, you know, it may be the delivery man for a particular product. <laughs> you know, it may be competitors uh, that you're actually talking to. You know, you run into a competitor at a trade show. You say, "Hi, I'm a company X." You know, uh, you know, we're in the same space. You know, and uh, what are you guys doing with X, Y, or Z? You know, uh, but it's you're actually out there talking to people and finding out what's going on right now. Uh, the other form of uh, research uh, is what what we call secondary sources. Uh, and these are sources that can be reached and are in the public domain. 
And so these are things, you know, when you go out and you, you do a Google search, well, that's a secondary search. Search, You know, when you go to journals, you look at scientific papers, you, you dig out conference proceedings, you, you know, you look at uh, press releases, uh, websites, and, and uh, you know, help wanted ads. That, they're all considered secondary sources of information, and they tend to be older in nature. Uh, they tend to be, um, in, in some cases, a little less insightful, but in their entirety, you know, give you a pretty good picture of what that industry looks like. And uh, and so, any effective collection strategy should be a combination of both, because they typically one can validate the other. One can validate, uh, you know, if if you have a you know a CTO from a company saying this is what we're doing, and you've you know found a patent that says they filed on a particular technology, and you've also seen a press release. Uh, where they've you know gotten investment to follow that strategy, then you're probably on a good uh, a pretty good path to ha having an understanding of what they're up to. So some of the typical research areas that uh, you typically would look at are uh, things like fundamental science. You know, so you're tracking new fundamental knowledge. This is uh, you know uh, research papers coming out of universities, uh, research facilities. You know, this is the groundbreaking stuff. Uh, Another area would be you know, the current state of technology. So, you know, uh, this is looking at you know what what technology is currently being used to solve a problem or pain in the market. Uh, is there emerging technologies that are starting to get traction? Uh, you know, are are there new developments uh, with technology development that you're starting to see? Uh, Another thing is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is it's really about companies and who the key players are in a particular marketplace, who your competitors are, what are the capabilities, plans, intentions, and for a lot of startups, you know, there's a lot of focus on uh, the company level uh, intelligence gathering because you want to know uh, where you fit in that whole uh, ecosystem. Uh, another thing, another area really is in the market and the industry and. Uh, Anyway, I'm not going to get into much of that, but uh, it's you know it's about future business prospects, and it may be about trying to identify who you can partner with down the road. So you know it may be a situation where uh, you know number one in a particular industry just invested in one of your competitors who has a supporting technology. Well, chances are number two is to maintain competitive parity is looking for something similar, and if you have that something similar, then maybe you should be approaching number two in that market, saying, hey. I can help you uh, with that competitive parity uh, by using my technology and, and partnering with you. So some sources of information that can use, and, and they're quite varied, and, and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some interesting sort of approaches to that. Uh, here at NRC, uh, you know, we have the luxury of having a lot of subscription databases, and depending on the size of the firm, uh, you may or may not be able to access some of these things. And these are things like Frost and Sullivan, uh, Strategic Business Insights, Enography. Uh, you know, you may use Dun & Bradstreet now. Uh, you know, Gartner, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the magic quadrant that Gartner puts out on a number of uh, industries. You know, and these things tend to be very expensive, and, uh, and they, but they tend to be fairly insightful. Uh, one of the things I did notice after using all of these uh, for a number of years is that what tends to happen is that someone will do a seminal piece of research and the rest of them will start citing the same thing. And so in some cases you may buy a report uh, you know, from marketresearch.com and it's using the same analysis and same uh, data that you see in three or four other places, uh, which is a little frustrating if you're buying this stuff. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, Company-specific websites are also very rich sources of information, especially about your competitors. And things like company press releases and white papers are uh, can be incredibly insightful. A lot of startup companies and early stage, you know, uh, uh, companies are always in a cycle of looking for investment. And because they're always in a cycle of looking for investment, they're always trying to put their best foot forward, and a lot, and, and they're always trying to, uh, you know, to, to really make a case as to why we're interesting and why you should invest in us. And because they're always in that state of uh, promotion, we'll say, they tend to throw out a lot of information that they probably ought not to. And, and and by going through the press releases and white papers, you can often find a lot of really rich information about what they're doing. You know, and, and 
like for example, uh, you know, if you're a uh, you know a, a startup and you've just gotten a seed round from a from a a larger company, and that l larger company is a publicly traded company, well, you can actually follow the uh, you know the annual report annual reports uh, back to the company that did the investing if they're public, and actually in those uh, annual reports there may be a paragraph or two that describes why. Uh, why they made that acquisition, or why they made that investment, and and you know, and what the basis of it was, which can often give you rich information about what your competitor ha has been up to. Uh, another really interesting spot that uh, a lot of people don't think about, but I, I mean, this is one of the things that I would always do when I was doing some research is look at job ads, uh, based on the qualifications that one of your competitors is looking for in one of their job ads, you can tell a lot about what they're doing. Uh, you know, they'll specifically say, I need an electrical engineer who has expertise in X, Y, and Z. Well, if they need three of them, you know they have a major push. They've probably gotten some investment to pay for that. They have a major push in that technology area. And if it's something that's directly related to what you're working on, that can be very telling. And in a lot of cases, these job ads get very, very specific about the duties and responsibilities. And you can pretty much tell exactly what they're trying to develop based on how they describe it in a job ad. Uh, trade shows is another really rich source. Uh, but a lot of people don't manage trade, uh, uh, trade shows and conferences uh, very well. Uh, and you could, I mean, you could do a full three-day uh, seminar on just, just this, you know. Uh, and I know I have done... Uh, been to seminars on it, but it's one of those things that people take for granted, and they spend a lot of money on. You know, they uh, so so when you go to a trade show or a conference, a you have to know what kind of a conference it is. You know, sometimes it's about sharing information. Sometimes it's actually a conference to do selling. If you don't know that up front, uh, you could be sadly disappointed with your investment to go there. The other thing is, when you go to one of these trade shows or conferences, you really need to know who it is you want to talk to when you go there. And, uh, and in a lot of cases, you know, uh, do the planning up front and reach out to some of these people to make sure you've got the meetings arranged that you want so that when you actually do it, uh, you get the most value out of it. So when you get there, it's not about standing around a booth. It's about having meetings, having engagements, talking to the right players that you've identified that are critical in your market. And, uh, and when you walk away from that show, you've, you've, you've got some rich information. You know, and in a lot of cases, it may even be contracts or investment opportunities. Uh, training events are another interesting spot to gather information. Uh, but more important with training is the counterintelligence piece. And by counterintelligence, what I mean is if you send people off to training, chances are other companies in your space are sending people there as well. And so your, your, uh, your staff are out there uh, mingling with staff from other companies that are doing similar things. In a lot of cases, it may be your direct competitors. And so you have to be very, you have to be very clear uh, and have a clear policy with your staff as to what they're allowed or not allowed to talk about when they go to these things. But also, uh, you know, you can use them as an asset to collect information for you about things. Uh, I was at a conference a few years ago and there was a senior person from a large military contractor from the US there and there was a junior person from one of their competitors and uh, and I got quite familiar with the senior guy and uh, you know we went out for, uh, for, 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 uh, for drinks after the training and he was telling me that you know she was trying to impress him about, by you know, talking about uh, you know a contract that they were mutually bidding on and he said like she told him way too much information about what was going on in, in the other company and in this case it, it was probably you know a, a tens of million dollar contract and he said, you know, I'm not going to use this information, but, you know, she was really, uh, this, this, uh, this analyst that, that was there at the training, uh, she really should be uh, trained in counterintelligence because she's saying way too much. Uh, another tool that's very popular is social media. And, you know, again, a uh, very powerful tool because, uh, you know, see my earlier uh, rant on what people uh, are, are constantly doing in startups. They're out trying to make them seem like make themselves seem like they're much more bigger and more important than they really are. And social media is a great avenue to spread that word. And so it's a rich uh, resource to manage. And and any uh, you know kind of 
uh, strategy in your firm uh, to do ongoing market intelligence really involves a strategy on how you manage your social media uh, platforms and how you gather information from them. And I really don't have the time to get into it today, but uh, I, I think you're all aware of the importance of this. I just threw this in in case any of you wanted the slide deck. It's kind of a, a bit of a Coles notes of, of different sources here. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to go through this at all, but I think I've already covered a, a number of these things, but it can give you some ideas. So information analysis is the next part, and as you can see, there's a bit of a pattern in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. I'm actually going through the entire intelligence cycle, and, uh, and so where we are now is, is what, what's called information analysis. And really what that is is a detailed examination of the available information uh, that's forward-looking and decision-relevant. And really what that means is, is taking what you've found. So now you've gone out, uh, you've created a mandate, you've uh, done your kits and kicks, you've gone out and done your research, you've gathered all of your information, and now you say, so what? So what do I do with it now? Now you've got, so you're taking that market research that you've got and you're turning it into something that's actionable. And it, you're, you're turning it into something that's uh, that can lead to the right, uh, uh, lead to a decision or concrete action in your firm. So there's a lot of tools out there, and depending on your education and depending on uh, the environment you run in, uh, you've been exposed to a number of of. Uh, of these things, you know, things like strategic analysis, the, the strategic analysis, so many of you are probably familiar with SWOT analysis, uh, it's kind of a uh, one of those must-haves on a lot of business plans I see. There's also value chain analysis, uh, some of you are probably familiar with uh, the work by Michael Porter and the, the different force models that he's had. Uh, then there's also something that's uh, competitive and customer analysis, so you know, these are things where you segment your, uh, you do segmentation uh, analysis on your customers that you've identified. Uh, management profiling is also another uh, very interesting technique because what it does is, you know, the, the premise is that you identify the key management teams in organizations and you look at what they've done in the past and you look at their skill sets and then you can use that to help determine the direction that the company may likely go. In a lot of cases, you know, man uh, senior management are recruited for who they know or what they've done in the past. And you know, and, and so if you know that some guy was a senior manager or uh, with a with a you know a, a large company in a particular field, then they probably take those contacts and those connections with them. And so you can get some pretty good ideas as to where the next steps might be based on that management profiling. Uh, there's also a whole field of uh, analysis t techniques called environmental uh, analysis, uh, and these are things like scenario analysis or stakeholder analysis. A lot of times, you, you probably do those. A another fun one that, uh, that that I've used in the past is something called wargaming, uh, and the idea with wargaming uh, is really about the whole premise is to really uh, look at alternative scenarios for an uncertain future. And so the idea is, you know, there's there's something coming in the future in your firm uh, that you're trying to prepare for. It may be something like a regulatory change. And so you've got a number of competitors, and the idea with war, war gaming is you sort of throw that out on the, on the table, and you say, okay, we're going to break groups of people into different competitor companies. And as the competitor company, uh, you start answering series of questions to see how that company would react to that regulatory change, for example. And it could be anything that's happening in the marketplace. And, and so what happens is after you've done several iterations of uh, potential changes, you can uh, assimilate the information and you get some really good uh, data back on uh, potential reactions by your competitors to you know, that uncertain future that's coming, coming your way. Uh, then there's a whole bunch of analysis uh, that they call evolutionary uh, analysis techniques. These are things like looking at the product life cycle. Uh, patent, patent information analysis is part of that, uh, where you know you look at who's got what patents, uh, what their patent strategy is, uh, what they've done in the past, uh, what's current, what they've filed and haven't had examined, and, and you can tell a fair bit about where the company's going based on the types of IP they have or the types of IP they, they've uh, 
acquired, or in some cases it may be where they're litigating on IP. So these sorts of things can give you a lot of information. And then there's a standard financial analysis. And as startups, a lot of you, uh, a lot of the competitors you're looking at may not even have uh, ready information here to do any analysis on. So it tends to be a little less uh, common in a startup world, but you know it's important skills to have nonetheless. And in some cases, you know if you're dealing with uh, public traded companies and you can get access to financials, it's uh, it's pretty rich. Uh, I wanted to run through a very basic technique that I use quite a bit, actually. That it, this is one of my favorite ones, and, and it's it's fairly simple. Uh, but what it does is it, it's it's really a method to identify the key factors that have to be performed well in order to achieve a superior level level of competitive performance in an industry. So it's called uh, critical success factor analysis, and and really what it's about is you know, at what, what is the baseline of uh, things I need to do in this marketplace in order to be relevant? Uh, you know, and are there things that if I don't do, uh, I will be, uh, that, that are, that are uh, indicators of uh, uh, potential failure? And so how you do this analysis really is you answer this series of questions, and I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but these are all industry level questions that you should have most of the information for in the, in the research that you've done. And what tends to happen when you start answering these questions is you start to see obvious trends. Because in some cases they're uh, sort of a, a different angle on the same question. You know? So if you look at on what basis the buyers of the product or service choose from competing offerings, and then, uh, then if you look at well, what do these customers desire or demand, uh, you're really asking the same question, but from a different direction. And so when you actually chart this information, I typically use a spreadsheet, uh, you start to see trends. And then what happens is you can actually nail it down to uh, typically three or four uh, industry level uh, criti critical success factors that you need to be aware of for a particular market segment that you're going after. So, for example, uh, in that medical practice example I used a little while ago, uh, you know, some of the the, the uh, success factors may be strong firm reputation in the market, and you know, it, it's the health field. Uh, you've, you've got a lot of privacy concerns. Uh, privacy and security is huge, and so. Uh, you need to be very the company that's a company that's trying to sell into this marketplace must have a strong reputation. Uh, you know that the information that they're being entrusted with uh, will be safe and secure. And if you don't, then it's a non-starter. Uh, you know, another another um, uh, CSF was uh, the software's designed for specific user groups. Uh, every medical discipline, while you're you know, it, it, they're all basic. Uh, uh, CRMs, the specific requirements of each one is very different, and so the software really needs to be designed specifically for them. Uh, another thing that was identified is competitive pricing, and, and especially if you're a smaller practice, you have to have very competitive pricing. Uh, you know, a lot of cases it's a one and two person operation, and if you don't have it, then uh, then they're just not. It's going to be unachievable to them, and. Sort of the fourth one that I'd come up with, come up with in this particular example is interoperability with other applications. And what that means is, in a lot of cases, they're using a legacy system, and because they're using a legacy system uh, that's often outdated, they have a lot of data that they want to be able to do something with. And so, you know, if you're going to try to get in the door with them, you have to have a mechanism whereby that data can be migrated to a new system. If you can't, it's a showstopper. So uh, anyway, yeah. So that's a really good technique, and I'll, uh, like I say, for anyone who wants the deck, some of this information can be available afterwards. But, but, uh, like I say, that that one I find is quite useful. Uh, another thing that uh, is often the case, especially when technology companies are involved, is use of patent analysis. And patent analysis is one of those things where there's a lot of it can be very, it can be very uh, labor intensive and time consuming, but the, the dividends, if you're a technology company, are huge. And so, uh, you know, your patent analysis may be looking at things like uh, intellectual property management and litigation. 
And so the, it's the, it's maybe the do I have the freedom to operate that I mentioned earlier? You know, is this a, is this a safe space in which I can do technology development? Uh, you may use it for your R&D management. In a lot of cases, uh, if you're a technical firm, then you need to have a strong IP strategy. And uh, patent analysis will help you dictate what your patent strategy looks like. And so, you know, it's, it's about who does what, uh, how they protect, how companies protect their patents, uh, you know, how to, who litigates what. And uh, uh, so these are things that are important. Uh, investment analysis as well is important. You can look at uh, who, who, uh, uh, who, who's investing in certain patent families, who's, who's acquiring IP rights to different pieces of technology. Uh, also, you can look at merger and actual, uh, merger and acquisition targeting and uh, due diligence processes and you know and and so uh, another part of this is uh, technology transfer and licensing again these are all part and parcel of the same sorts of things where you're looking at uh, you know if I if I have something uh, that I need for my product uh, you know can I license that technology from someone and if I can how do I find that technology and you can use patent analysis to help find some of these things uh, what I've done here is I've thrown out a few tools. Uh, you know, or there are a lot of really uh, detailed patent search tools available for for hire. Uh, you know, NRC has uh, some some of these tools that uh, we use internally, but you know, subscriptions to these are you know in the order of thousands of dollars uh, annually. Uh, but but there are free tools that you can use as uh, entrepreneurs. And so the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, CEPO, if you go to their website, they have uh, a bunch of webinars and for training on, on, on intellectual property, but they also have uh, uh, a search engine that you can use for doing your patent searching. Uh, the U European Patent Office, or SPASNET, they have some really good tools as well for doing searching. And the uh, United States Patent Office uh, it also has some really good search tools. And so... Uh, I think you know it, it certainly doesn't hurt to, uh, especially if you're looking at an international uh, patent, uh, to look at three of these uh, when you're doing some of your searching on patents to make sure that you're covered. Because sometimes the interoperability uh, doesn't show up that well. Now we're getting towards the end. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through. I've got a, a two slides left. Uh, one is on assembly, presentation, and delivery here. And the key takeaway from this is that uh, you need to be very clear on your audience up front, and you need to manage the, the, the deliverables and timelines based on what you've agreed to in your mandate. And so, uh, if you know, for example, uh, you uh, your manager wants uh, something in a report, then know that up front, and so you you know put the time and invest into doing a formal. Uh, uh, intelligence briefing. Uh, some cases they may want it uh, in, in a PowerPoint presentation that you're delivering to the company or to the executive team in which case you know knowing that up front is very important uh, in some cases they you know they want you to come in and do a verbal presentation uh, or they may want a weekly or monthly alert on different uh, things that are going on in the marketplace but knowing uh, what's expected up front is very important and another thing that you really need to do is make sure that what you find, the actions that you come forward with, are actionable. And so, you know, it's it's I can't, I can't help but reiterate, you know, the actionable intelligence is the key here. Uh, you know, y what you provide should influence future behavior. And if it's not, then uh, then uh, you got to wonder, well, what was the what was the point of it, right? Final thoughts, uh, as I said, you need to get buy-in from management up front. Uh, you know, intelligence without being acted on is quite useless, and so management has to believe in what you're doing, and uh, they have to help uh, set the mandate and set the agenda, and that comes through, uh, you know, uh, discussions and effort up front, uh, but it'll pay dividends in the end. Uh, the findings that you come up with need to be communicated within the organization. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, it, it needs to be a company-wide buy-in on what you're doing here, and so people need to understand 
the kinds of things you're looking for and the kinds of things that the results of what you come up with are, are going to, how they're going to influence the behavior of the company and the direction of the company. Uh, because another part of it, which I never really got into here, but uh, organizations need a me mechanism for capturing intelligence from staff. Uh, staff in a company is, are, are a, a fantastic uh, tool for gathering that human intelligence. They're, inter they're interacting with clients, they're interacting with suppliers, they're interacting with any number of uh, players in the industry value chain and uh, you need a mechanism to capture some of that information and, and make it part of your decision making process. And the final thing is that there should be a feedback loop uh, where you can tell whether or not the results you came up with and the action that you uh, had brought forward was valid or not. And these things need to be tracked over time and you know both from a uh, you know it, it's it's a strong endorsement when you can actually have show a track record of success and you know see the first point you need management buy-in well what gives management buy-in more than a successful track record of of providing the sorts of information having it acted on and having positive results result from it and that only can occur through tracking this information over time and that's it I know it's a lot of information I know it was a little dry in places but thank you for your patience and hopefully uh, some of this stuff uh, is relevant and can have some value to you. Thanks so much, Peter. That was definitely a very, very insightful presentation with, like you said, lots of information that we will share with all of our viewers uh, post uh, this broadcast. But I'm going to invite everyone now uh, who's listening to submit their questions to Peter using hashtag Startup School on Twitter. And we've had some questions coming in throughout the hour, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, so Natalie Kay on Twitter asks, there are a lot of market research reports that look familiar, similar. How do you ensure you get the best one? Um, that's tough. Uh, that's a tough one because, uh, you know, they're all out there trying to uh, sell their products. It comes down to research. Uh, I certainly, if possible, uh, and you've got access to uh, anyone who has experience with purchasing these things in the past, uh, Tapping into uh, that knowledge, in, in a lot of cases, uh, depending where you are, uh, there may be uh, uh, places like uh, uh, some of these resources like uh, Canada Business where they may have gone out and bought these things for clients in the past and they may have some experience with what's a good one or what's not. Uh, you know, and, and typically uh, the ones that tend to be good over time uh, are consistently good over time and so I, I would before I spend any money, I would try to do some research with uh, some people that you may know in your in your uh, ecosystem who have had experience with using them in the past. It's a bit of a crapshoot, though I, I have to admit, and uh, sometimes it's an expensive one. Yeah, that's a great tip, though. Um, definitely looking at Canada Business and other of your peers that have been looking uh, for information as well. So I've also got a question here from uh, Barry on Twitter, he asks, where do you look for patent litigation? Uh, patent litigation uh, often, uh, it's not expressly uh, identified in some of the patent databases, uh, but uh, if you use some of the patent search tools, uh, it can be readily identified, and in some cases you may have to actually uh, work with a uh, patent agent who would have access to these tools and if you know specifically what you're looking for they can help identify what litigation has been done on certain patents. Unfortunately I don't know of any free sources to get that easily but uh, typically a lot of these tools can can draw it out fairly readily and shouldn't be that expensive. Great and moving on to question number three here um, Brennan Piper asks whether or not surveying is a useful tool to gauge market interest and begin organizing demographics. He asks whether or not respondents often say one thing and then do another, and whether or not there's a better way to go about this. Uh, surveying is, is one form. Uh, what I would suggest is you take an approach of, of, uh, of, of uh, what, what we typically would do uh, is you take the survey data and you temper that against what you know what uh, 
customers are telling you or what suppliers are telling you or what you found in the research and you sort of uh, try to uh, temper all these things together to get a better answer. Uh, I would certainly recommend that doing surveying is an important uh, function but you need to temper it against something else because as, as he said uh, sometimes there's biases that creep into it and in some cases it's really a matter of uh, you know measuring it against the other information you have and see how it aligns. So, so the short answer is uh, don't rely on it exclusively and try to find other things, other proxies to the same information and see how well they match. Perfect. And our last Twitter uh, question for now, uh, Barry also asks, what do you mean by a market vertical? You were talking about that around slide six, I believe. Okay, what I mean by market vertical is uh, one specific, uh, for example, in the example I was using with the medical software, a vertical may be uh, a dentist office. Another vertical may be optometrists. Another vertical may be uh, chiropractors, right? These are specific areas of interest uh, in a marketplace where you're targeting uh, your, your product or service. And so my advice mostly to companies is really uh, each vertical requires a huge amount of knowledge and information gathering to completely understand it. And so a lot of times with startups what I find is that they don't uh, they, they don't do a very good job of picking the verticals they're going after so they try to do too many and uh, the exercise of getting information on all of them it can be really challenging. Mm -hmm. So be specific, keep focused. Perfect. So I'm going to squeeze in at least one more question here before we have to wrap things up. Um, but you touched briefly on social media and the importance of that in gathering market intelligence. So I was just hoping in our last two minutes you could offer your top piece of advice for using social media, especially for uh, startups that are just starting out and might not have resources to uh, be going to trade shows yet or things like this or buying market data. Uh, my, my top piece of advice is find out who your competitors are and follow them. Right? Uh, they're going to tell you uh, what they're up to uh, because they need, you have to think about it from their perspective, even if you look at it from your own perspective as a startup, you're trying to generate interest in what you're doing. And how do you try to generate interest? You throw it out there and tell the world that I'm doing these great things. Well, if you, they're your competitor, uh, I want to know that. And so I'm using social media and so I'm going to track, I'm going to follow you. You know, I'm going to be your Twitter follower. I'm going to uh, be your uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, contact. You know, I'm going to follow you on Facebook, and uh, and I'm going to watch what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And going off of that, you were talking earlier about how entrepreneurs, especially early in the game, are revealing a lot of information that perhaps they shouldn't be uh, to protect their own best interests. But I'm wondering if you have um, a couple of things that uh, entrepreneurs should be keeping to themselves that they often let let go in those conversations? Well, there's a number of things, and, and, and it, it's really a case by case. What I would suggest is uh, there's a number of resources out there that they should familiarize themselves with that will help you uh, build a, you know, a strategy for your firm uh, for, for holding this information uh, or for managing this types of information. Because sometimes it's imperative that you've got to let some of this stuff go. And, and often there's never, uh, you know, there's no one case where you shall not ever say this. Uh, what I would suggest is you find a good resource on counterintelligence and you develop a policy for your company and you do some training with your staff on the sorts of things that are uh, that are acceptable and not acceptable. Great. So, so it's, it's really about developing a strategy and, and implementing it. Perfect. And before I let you go, we are at 1 o'clock. Do you have any final tips for entrepreneurs who are looking to gather some market intelligence? Yes, I do. Uh, the, one of the things, that just, uh, the takeaway, one of the takeaways from this thing, uh, that process of, of, uh, of doing a mandate and of staying very focused on what you're looking for and biting off bite-sized pieces of market intelligence is crucial because otherwise you're doing a, an ocean boiling exercise. Not to use that term again, but uh, it can be very daunting and can be huge time suck if you're not careful. So you really need to be careful on what it is you're looking for and knowing when you have enough. And that kits and kicks process that I mentioned in this presentation is a very powerful technique for that. The other point is the information you have has to be actionable. Other, other than that, it's just information. It has no value. 
Well, that's a good way to wrap things up. Everything must be <laughs> actionable. That's awesome. Um, so to anyone else who has questions on Twitter or through any of our other social media channels, if you just send us an email, uh, hello at startupcan.ca, we can make sure that we connect you with Peter uh, and connect you also with the great information that was available in his slide deck. So Peter, thank you so much for spending your time with us today and for being such a valued guest on the third edition of our Startup School as part of Startup Canada Live. As, uh, to everyone who joined today, ask questions, all the entrepreneurs, startup community leaders and members, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you join us for the next installment of Startup School with Bradley Pinch on Business Modeling 101. That takes place right here on Google Hangouts, April 11th from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, as well, we make sure that you check out the Startup Canada podcast tomorrow, which will be downloadable at startupcan.ca forward slash podcast. Tomorrow we feature Janice McDonald. She's a, a great entrepreneur that you'll want to hear, hear her insights from. So you can also stay informed on all of the latest opportunities and announcements and entrepreneur events by following Startup Canada on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Google Plus and LinkedIn. So thank you again to Peter, to all of our, uh, our guests here. Have an enterprising week, everyone. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Bye now. Bye-bye.